Please welcome to the TEDx Sonoma County stage, Dr. Andrew Davidoff. Thank you very much. I'd like to start by presenting a clinical picture. So imagine you're a young man with hemophilia. Because of this, you have a real propensity to bleed. So throughout your life, you've stayed away from contact sports. You're now very careful when you shave. You stay away from circumstances where you might bang your head. And although you like to travel, hike, and camp, you're really reluctant to stay away from medical care. Well, actually, you're one of the fortunate few because you can afford and have access to modern medical care. Most of hemophiliacs throughout the world don't even have that. So you, you want more. You want more for yourself. And the thing that, that bothers you the most, in fact, is that you may transfer the genetic abnormality to your daughters and your grandsons may be afflicted with the same disease. So you're looking more from medical and scientific community. What I'd like to present this afternoon is our work at trying to provide more for patients with hemophilia through a gene therapy approach. Well, hemophilia B is a severe inherited bleeding disorder due to a deficiency of human clotting factor 9 it affects about 1 in 30,000 males, so about 5,000 patients in the United States, about 100,000 worldwide, with over half having what we call severe hemophilia, essentially no factor IX clotting activity. And this results in a phenotype that's one of frequent, spontaneous bleeding, particularly within the joints, but can occasionally occur within the brain which often can be fatal. Shown here is Queen Victoria, perhaps the most famous carrier of the trait for hemophilia B. Unfortunately, she passed this on to her descendants, uh, and it really ravaged royalty, not only in the United Kingdom, but throughout Europe in the early 1900s. Well, the, the cause for hemophilia was really appreciated in the early 1950s, and that led to early therapy which included the administration of human plasma because it contained small amounts of normal clotting factor IX. By the 1960s, we'd figured out how to concentrate the clotting factors in the form of cryoprecipitate. But unfortunately, at this time, testing of blood products was really in its infancy and very inadequate. And so during the 1970s and early 1980s, over half patients with hemophilia contracted HIV or hepatitis C because of this approach to transfusion replacement therapy. Well, a significant breakthrough occurred in 1982 with the actual sequencing of the gene for factor IX, and that enabled, albeit 15 years later, the development and commercial availability of recombinant replacement protein. But both patients and caregivers would certainly agree that current replacement therapy is inadequate. Much more is needed. Transfusion of factor IX protein requires intravenous infusion very frequently on the order of two to three times a week. And as you can imagine, this is very expensive and not readily available throughout the world. And even with this replacement therapy occurs what we call breakthrough bleeding. So despite trying to replace the missing protein, patients with hemophilia still have bleeding episodes, particularly within their joints, leading to chronic disabling joint disease. Well, if you'll allow me, I'd like to take you back to high school biology briefly as we start to think about gene therapy. So shown here are the steps involved in making a protein within the cell of a body. So it starts in the nucleus with the genetic material that is DNA through a process called transcription. The cell makes RNA, which gets modified and exported out of the nucleus. And this messenger RNA serves as the template for translation in which amino acids are strung together and then folded, generating a protein which can either work within the cell 
or be exported uh, outside of the cell. Well, so what then really is gene therapy? Well, it's a fundamental attempt to replace a defective gene, gene that's responsible for disease, with a normal gene. And that will really correct the disease at the most basic genetic level, uh, and it results in the synthesis of normal protein. But really, the benefit of gene therapy, I think, is that it provides a lasting solution. So if you replace the template, if you replace the gene, your effect will last within the cell for a lifetime and thereby give you the potential for a cure after possibly just a single intervention. Whereas if you're simply constantly replacing the protein that gets broken down, you need to do this again and again, really throughout the lifetime of the patient. I particularly like this schematic because it shows the surgeon's scalpel uh, affecting gene therapy. So again, just to, just to put uh, things in a, a simple, I hope, perspective, in the case of disease, in the case of hemophilia, there's a mutated uh, a gene for factor IX that leads, leads to the synthesis of an abnormal, non-functional protein. By reintroducing therapeutic DNA or normal DNA, we can coax the cell or educate the cell into synthesizing the normal missing protein. Well, hemophilia B is particularly well-suited for this gene therapy approach. Our goal is long-term protein replacement, but it's conceptually a very simple disease. So if we can just replace the one missing protein, we've cured the patients. And in fact, we don't even need to replace factor IX at 100% of normal level. Most hematologists would suggest that if we could replace it at about 20%, those patients would be cured. But even 1% to 5% replacement in a patient with severe hemophilia B will make a profound impact on their bleeding phenotype. Well, how do, one, how do we transfer this genetic material to the body? Well, there are a variety of ways of delivering genes, broadly considered uh, vectors. And you can see they're broken down into categories of viral vectors and non-viral vectors. I don't have the time to go into the, the benefits of each of these, uh, but just to point out that our vector of choice is this adeno-associated virus. This is a schematic of what adeno-associated virus, or AAV, looks like. On the outside, it has this protein coating, or capsid, and on the inside, it has its viral genome, in which the only two genes that it encodes are listed here. For comparison, the human genome is felt to have about 20,000 genes uh, coding for protein, so a very simple organism. But to take this virus and make it into a viral vector, what we do is we actually remove these two genes and replace it with what we call an expression cassette, a cassette that will, will direct a synthesis of our gene of interest, in this case, factor IX. So, we and others have found that AAV is really a very promising delivery system. It's very safe. Probably most people in this audience have been infected with AAV without clinical consequence. On its own, it can't even replicate. It requires the presence of another virus uh, to help it replicate. Because we've removed the genes encoding viral proteins, it's much less likely to generate an immune response. And most importantly for our patients, it facilitates long-term expression of the transgene of interest. Well, here again is a schematic of our approach to gene therapy for patients with hemophilia. So I mentioned uh, we, we take the DNA for the normal factor IX protein. We have it uh, placed within that protein coating of the AAV virus. We give this viral vector by simple peripheral IAV infusion. But because of the tropism of the virus, nearly all of it ends up in the liver, which is in fact what we want because the liver is the normal site of factor IX synthesis. And you can see here the AAV virus uh, infecting the target cell, in this case liver cells, and delivering the payload of the normal gene for factor IX, which the cell then uses to synthesize uh, and secrete normal factor IX protein. Well, for the last uh, three or so years, we've conducted an early phase dose escalation 
study of AAV-mediated factor IX gene transfer for patients with severe hemophilia B. This is the official name of the vector that we're using. It's a very simple process, a peripheral vein infusion over about uh, 20 minutes. Our primary goal is to assess the safety of this approach, but we have other secondary objectives, including measuring the activity of factor IX for the patient, so the efficacy of this approach. We also want to see the body's immune reaction to both the vector and the protein that's being synthesized, and we want to see how the body clears uh, the vector from uh, the circulation. Well, we're fortunate at St. Jude to have our own manufacturing facility uh, on the campus, shown here. And this is the tissue culture room where AAV vector is being made. And one of the points of this slide is to show you that it's really a very cumbersome, labor-intensive process we have uh, these are referred to as cell factories, so you can see dozens of cell factories along the racks, all uh, making AAV. This all gets distilled down through, a, again, a very laborious process to this very simple vial of AAV vector, again, encoding factor IX, which is given by IV injection to the patients. Well, we have a very uh, extensive uh, informed consent process with patients who are considering uh, participating in our trial. We talk about the risks of developing an antibody to the vector, developing an antibody to the new factor IX protein, of getting inflammation in the liver because of this viral infection of the liver. There's also the possibility, although most of the vector goes to the liver, that it goes to other organs outside of the liver. In addition, whenever talking about gene therapy, one needs to be concerned about the possibility through this process of insertional mutagenesis, of actually causing uh, cancer in the liver. And then for this patient with an inherent uh, bleeding disorder, even simple blood tests are not trivial uh, maneuvers. So this table highlights the demographics of the participants thus far in our clinical trial. I mentioned that it was a dose escalating study, so you can see that two patients received intermediate dose of, uh, low dose of vector, two received intermediate dose of vector, and because we showed that it was safe with both of those doses, we were allowed to expand our cohort of patients who received the highest dose of vector. The other things to point out in this table are the fact that all patients had severe hemophilia B, so essentially no factor IX activity, they all received prophylactic therapy on the order of two to three times a week. But despite this therapy, you can see that they all have had a number of spontaneous bleeding episodes throughout the previous year, highlighting the fact that current therapy is really very inadequate. So I mentioned that the primary objective was to assess the safety, and in fact, uh, administration of the vector was very well tolerated. Here are the vital signs of the first patient during the vector infusion, and they're normal. And in fact, I can assure you that my personal pulse and blood pressure were much higher than his uh, at the time of uh, vector infusion. The other thing to highlight the simplicity of this process is this fellow was an IT guy, and here he is working on one of our cell phones that was uh, broken during the course of his <laughs> vector infusion. So, to summarize uh, the results from our clinical trial, 10 patients thus far have received vector for severe hemophilia B. As I mentioned, vector administration was very well tolerated. It was cleared uh, from secretions and excretions within about three to six weeks. And importantly, there was no immune reactivity to the new factor IX that was being synthesized. It was very effective with every patient who participated having an increase in their factor IX activity level, those in the low dose on the order of 1% to 2%, those in the high dose on the order of 6 to 8%. And this effect was lasting, and this is really the first gene therapy trial to show a lasting effect of gene transfer, with the original patients now being followed out for over three and a half years. And so despite these, what you might think are fairly modest levels of factor IX activity, this has made a profound impact on the quality of life for those patients who participated. The majority of them have actually been able to do away completely with 
prophylactic infusion, so two to three times per week, intravenous administration of medication done away with. In the other two patients, although they've not done away with prophylactic therapy completely, they've been able to expand the intervals between uh, dosing. They've been able to get back to the contact sports and other activities that they love without the fear of spontaneous or traumatic uh, bleeding. So I think that, that the results from this trial, the preliminary results, are very encouraging. We've shown that this approach is safe. We've shown that it's effective. I will admit that more is still needed, so we mentioned that we're really shooting for about 20% levels to think that these patients have been cured. We also need to find a way to make this vector more readily available. I, I tried to give you a feel for how labor-intensive uh, the, the procedure is for making the vector. Clearly, advances are needed if we're thinking about uh, using this as a worldwide uh, treatment. And there are still issues to overcome related to the immunity of a viral vector uh, infection. So what are our personal plans at St. Jude? Well, again, for hemophilia B, we'd like to establish higher levels of factor IX so that the patients can be uh, considered cured. One way to do that is to simply give a higher dose. Another way to do that is to improve the efficiency of factor IX expression from our construct. We'd like to move on to hemophilia A, which is a related and actually much more common a bleeding disorder. It's due to a deficiency of factor VIII. We didn't start with hemophilia A because some unique aspects of it made it uh, more of a technical challenge. It's a bigger protein, it's more immunogenic. So we started with hemophilia B. But then uh, we'd like to do more. We'd like to move on to other monogenetic disorders. And in addition, we'd really like to move on to uh, gene therapy for cancer. So I, I show this uh, pie chart just to give you an idea that there's a lot of work uh, going on in gene therapy for a whole variety of diseases. Listed here are cancer, cardiovascular disease, infectious diseases, including HIV and influenza. So clearly all the major uh, human diseases are being approached uh, with uh, gene therapy techniques these days. And so I just want to end uh, by uh, recalling this adage that says, if you give a man a fish, uh, he'll eat for a day. If you teach a man to fish, he'll eat for a lifetime. And I, I sort of view the same thing with uh, gene therapy for hemophilia. If you give a patient with hemophilia B replacement protein, you've helped them for a day or two. If you give them the gene that's the template for the synthesis of the normal protein, they can then synthesize the protein themselves, perhaps for a lifetime after just a single intervention. So I think, uh, really, in this case, providing more with less. Thank you. <laughs>